Now to Hebrew, numbers are symbols. They mean other than a quantity, which is Western way of thinking is quantity. How many of this? How much of that? How much did that weigh? How tall is this? How wide is that? Um, but that's not the way Easterners think of it because they're symbolic. They mean something besides. So in the story of David and Goliath, the, uh, the items that were measured, the items that were weighed, were talked about. And they come up with the number <laughs> 666. That should get some juices rolling at that point. Um, because they didn't weigh everything. They didn't weigh the helmet. They didn't weigh all the full armor. They didn't weigh his sandals. They didn't weigh, you know, uh, a lot of his other things. But the shield, They but they weighed the spearhead, <laughs> you know. Or did they weigh the, the shield? No, it's the spearhead. The spearhead and I, two other items that I can't not, I'm struggling to recollect. But um, we'll let him tell the story on that. To a Hebrew, numbers are first of all symbols. They communicate information, data, but they're first of all symbols. To a Greek, numbers are first of all quantity. David and Goliath, one of the first Bible stories most of you ever learned. Story of David and Goliath starts out, Goliath from Gath, which is such a, uh, that's another time. Goliath from Gath is six cubits tall. Now be honest, you're Westerners, what's your question? What's a cubit? You want to know how tall the guy was. Nine foot six. I believe that's true, that's in the Bible. I take the Bible as inspired. Then it says... His armor, his, um, yeah, his armor weighed 60 shekels. And your question is? Then there's a textual variant. So one version has one or one has the other. But I think the best version is his um, spear point weighed 6,000 talents. And your question is? Now the Jew says, wait a minute. Why didn't he tell us what the helmet weighed? Why didn't he tell us what the sword weighed? Why did he pick those three? Well, if Goliath had a uniform on, played for, I don't care, wherever you come from, what would his number have been? Six, six, six. And the writer has just told you, not what Goliath is, that's a Western thing. The writer has told you who he is. Who is Goliath? Six cubits, six, in Hebrew, there are no numbers. Um, they use our numbers today. But to say 60, you have to have the six and then add the 10. To say 6,000, you have to have the six and then the thousand. So you've, in the Hebrew text, you have three sixes, six cubits, six T shekels, 6,000. So his numbers are six, six, six. Which means the devil. This guy is of the devil. The writer wants you to know this isn't about a little guy beating a big guy. This is about the devil and God. And how does David kill him? With a, okay, bless you for saying that, but that is so stinking Western. I know what he did. I know the information. What with the rock? Where does he hit him? Now, what did God promise to Eve? Someday, the descendant of Eve, that is the follower of God, would do to the descendant of Satan. Crush his. And when a Jewish kid in third grade reads that story, they say, yes, God's promise in Genesis 3 is still true. It's still happening. Look, the follower of God destroyed the follower of the snake with a stone right in his head, just like God's. And you know what? Westerners go to seminary and they come out saying he was six, nine foot six tall. His spear point weighed 18 pounds and his armor weighed 56 pounds, which is true. But so what? The picture, 
the picture. The picture. So, just going on and talking about, you know, what was in that first episode Mm -hmm. where Ray Van Erlen was talking. He also added um, kind of what the school schooling system and ages looked like. And I thought it was really interesting that, you know, they start off at five or six memorizing the Torah, you know, memorizing, learning, all of that stuff. And then I think it's at age 12 is whenever they kind of move on to the more, um, I guess you could say complex parts of the Torah, just different types of memorization and, you know, recalling stuff and different ways of um, talking about it, for, for lack of a better word. But, yeah, they do that at 12, 13, and even some of the ones that are really gifted, they'll actually maybe start um, practicing or learning from a rabbi in the area, and they'll kind of go on to more um, in-depth study but under that's the rabbi. Like at, at the age of 15, right? Well, it says that they could start as young as 12 or 13, but it does talk about at 15. I think we have that on here. Um, yeah, it says the truly gifted would travel and study with a famous rabbi as a Talmud, which Talmud means disciple. Mm-hmm. And Talmudim, Talmudim means disciples, plural. So, anyway, so the disciples' goal was to become like their rabbi. They weren't just, like over here in the West, you know, we we learn stuff so that we can speak it back and pass tests. They, they weren't there for that. They were there to become just like their rabbi, which is completely different. It is, it is, because uh, the young men that were received by the rabbi, because you you just didn't say, well, I'm going to follow you around and you're going to be my rabbi. You had to pass a test by him Mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. Um, And if he deemed you sharp enough, um, then he would take you on. But it wasn't just... I mean, you you paid to be part of this, to be one of his disciples. Yeah. You followed him around. You even would go to the bathroom with him because he would even say a blessing while he was in the bathroom. You didn't want to miss that. Mm-hmm. Okay. They slept together. They ate together. They bathed together. I mean, just because they wanted to become as that specific rabbi. Mm-hmm. Um, so they gave up a lot to do that. It was very high on every family's wish that their, especially the firstborn son, because there's a, a blessing in that, would be accepted by a rabbi. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I heard in some of these other um, teachings that the average is about one, one in 1,000 kids is received by a rabbi. Yeah. Um, and if the rabbi didn't think they could become like them, yeah, become like them, then they would say, well, you need, you know, you know your word, but it's, it's obvious that you should go home and follow in the footsteps of your father. Mm-hmm. And whether they were a fisherman or a baker or whatever, then you would go home and yeah. and do that with you know, the family business. Yeah, okay. and the cool thing about that is later on in some of these episodes, he talked about how when the disciples were called, they were found working with their fathers. So they, they obviously were, were they not were. chosen to become, to move on to the higher uh, levels. It, it, and he <laughs> talks about how funny it was that he's heard so many sermons of like how it must have been so hard for the disciples to leave their families and to leave their father. But he was like, no, their families were rejoicing and probably throwing a party because exactly. they, were chosen they were chosen to become like the rabbi. Well, and that, and that, it's scripture, just so that scripture of uh, Andrew and Simon. Um, no, it was James and John. Yep. James and John were fishing with their father. And here's Jesus. And he's actually one of the youngest rabbis 
Um, he is, you know, yeah. one of the youngest rabbis well, one of that the, there were. One of the the youngest rabbi with Shmiha, which we can talk about that. In yeah, a we will. We will shortly reach yeah. that. But he went to them as they're fishing with their father, and he said, "You and you come, uh, follow me." Uh, rabbis didn't do that. Okay, first of all, Jesus did everything different. What else is new, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> typical rabbis, you'd have to go to the rabbi, and you you would approach him, and you say, "Rabbi, oh, um, your reputation your has preceded re has you. preceded you, and." Um, uh, it would be such an honor and such a privilege to study under you. And I would desire, you know, to be your disciple. And then the, uh, rabbi would say something like, well, tell me then recite from Genesis. And then if this person would continue reciting and, and depending on how well they recited, he would either say, yes, you know, I would love yeah. to have you, or uh, you should go back and follow in the footsteps yeah. of your father. And he gave an example of like, you know, the questions that a <laughs> rabbi would ask. He would first, he would ask, you know, something yes. kind of simple, like, you know, recite Genesis, which that's not very simple to me. But to anyways, them it he would was. say that. And then he would say, now quote to me the places in, you know, Leviticus and Deuteronomy that talk about birds and then relate it to this passage over here in Esther. And, you know, what was it talking about? What was the, <laughs> what was the underlying, like, you know, prophecy or whatever? Like it would be really, really difficult. And correct. so, correct, man. And some people passed those tests, but a lot of them did not And that's when they would say, most of them didn't. Yeah. They would exactly. say, you know, you know, the word, well, you know, May God bless you, but go home and, you know, honor God by following your father's right. footsteps. And so not only did, did Jesus do that <clears throat> different, you know, I mean, he went searching for disciples. And I know his heavenly father, our heavenly father, directed him to do that. So here he found these fishermen. They were already looking for fish. So all he had to do was redirect them to look for men. Yeah. And, yeah. and fish for men. And so, um, my, I always had an issue with that particular scripture. Cause I'm thinking he took the man's kids. I mean, <laughs> you know, the, this guy didn't have to hire anybody cause he had his sons working for him. Um, so he had free labor per se and all the money stayed within the family instead of having to pay hired help. Gosh, I would think the Bible never even talks about the, what the father said or did or if he was happy, if he was sad, if he was, you know, well, we know now that what an honor that would have been to be for a rabbi to come to you, especially when you'd already been refused by other rabbis. Yeah. And then, okay. you know, the tax collectors, like those people were considered the scum of, of the earth. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's actually one reason why a lot of Jews don't believe that Jesus could be the Messiah because of his Talmudim, his disciples that he chose, they're like, real no, rabbis right. don't do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but Jesus was not like any other rabbi. Mm -hmm. And so that was fascinating. And it really helped me understand that passage with uh, James and John. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's wild how, you know, he did that in the stories. And because we don't know, culture and context we miss so, so many much. pastors start to interpret that story and they're like oh my goodness in a that western must have been... mindset yeah and they're like <laughs> oh that must have been so hard and it's like no they were throwing a party, party. Oh, because yeah. that was such an honor exactly exactly like, that just didn't happen it just that just opened my eyes i was like oh my gosh all these years i didn't understand yeah. and now i get it finally yeah so kind of back to what we were talking about of, you know, the ages, they would do certain things. I think it's generally 15 was the age when they would, you know, be tested to see if they could, you know, um, follow a rabbi. Mm -hmm. And if they did, then they would follow him for however many years until 
you know, as they, if they became skilled enough, even mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. they would become a Torah teacher, uh, a teacher of the law, maybe some other stuff under that. Ray Vanderland just talked about how they could become that. And then if they're like really exceptionally gifted and it's obvious that they just, really are just really dynamic teachers, then sometimes, and it's usually when they're pretty old, like I think they said, other than Jesus, the youngest rabbi to be Shmihad was like 60 or 70. In which, you know, what is Shmiha? Shmiha means authority to to do new teaching. Mm -hmm. Ray Vanderland talks about that in one of his episodes. So it's like, they two two other rabbis with Shmiha had to kind of bestow it That's, upon yeah, a person. Right. And so yeah, even if you listen to the series as you get into it, he'll talk about it and it just blows you away because it even shows you how much it's just so rare that Jesus at thirty years old had Shmiha and you can actually find that in the New Testament mm-hmm. where people believed that he did have it, and Jesus actually kind of explains in question form how he got it. It was through John, but um, really interesting stuff. So, well, it and it wasn't actually unusual for rabbis to pray for people and for them to be healed. The ones with shmiha, okay, the older ones. So, for them to see a young rabbi like Jesus healing people that was like wait a minute it really made them question and and because jesus was not in in the same custom timetable that they were used to they just had they they couldn't receive it i mean they were just like this is not possible it you have to be this old you have to have that kind of experience to be able to heal people mm-hmm. and to have such wisdom. Yeah. But it was demonstrated even at the age of 12, Jesus yeah. was in the synagogue when his parents were trying to leave Jerusalem. Yeah. And kind of misplaced them. Um, and they were just so amazed at the wisdom of, of a 12 year old boy. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, honestly, it blows my mind. I mean, obviously there were other reasons why the Jews didn't want to believe him because because of the way he, you know, disobeyed, in quotes, <laughs> the law and, you know, healed on the Sabbath and, you know, picked heads of grain on the Sabbath and did other things that, you know, they felt were unlawful, um, but they didn't realize that he was the lawmaker. <laughs> that he's the one who gave, you know, yeah, the laws and commandments and he was the fulfillment of those. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it's just, I just really want to capture how important like this stuff is. Like, I feel like some of these people are listening and they're still just like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> like, I'm kind of, you know, hopefully we're explaining it well enough, but you guys need to go back yes. and we're going to put a link uh, in the description, right, and we're going to list this series that we're talking about and also the resources that Ray Vanderland puts at the end of this series um, to help understand Jewish context and culture better. Yeah. So um, I'll actually read you guys the list of those. So some of the books that he recommends to get started um, understanding that stuff is called um, Our Father Abraham. Jesus, the Jewish theologian, and then God in search of man. Those are three resources of books that he tells you that you can, you know, dig into it better. And I think he recommends it in the understanding that we're beginners here, so they shouldn't be too difficult of a read for us us Westerners to understand. (laughs) But it's just, it really just blows my mind what what we're missing out on. Yeah. Exactly. Like we really are missing out. We're not saying, and Ray Vanderland's not saying that we've got it wrong. No. He's just saying there is such richness and, and depth and depth to the scripture that we yeah. just simply can't see. 
Because, oh, and I also yeah. would recommend, what's that book called? I think it's A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 yes. Shef- by Philip Keller. Keller, yeah. He kind of gets into Jewish um, culture as well as he explains how a shepherd cares for their sheep and mm-hmm. how important that is for us to understand it because Jesus calls us his sheep more than anything else in the Bible. And so that should ring very important to us that, hey, we need to know (laughs) what that really means because Jesus says he's our shepherd and we're his sheep. What does a shepherd do with his sheep? How does he care for them? That book has really been a blessing to me in helping me understand like how much and like just how, I guess you could say intimate, like he cares for us and just how thorough, just like he knows he knows everything and he really cares. Um, so that's all I got. What about you, Heidi? All I can say, uh, along with Alyssa, is I can't encourage you enough to follow up. And it's like 10 hours worth. Now, I know that sounds a lot, but I'm telling you, I plugged that in while I was driving to Florida and... It, the time went so fast, I could not believe how quick it just yeah. an hour went by. It was boom. It was like, what? Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> um, because he gives you so much information. He's explaining so much and you're like, ding, ding, ding. And all these bells are going off because you're making connections in your brain. Like, oh, this is making so much more sense to me now. Yeah. And it would really be worthwhile for you to pursue that invest the time. I've listened to it at least three times. Um, I know I need to listen to the whole thing all over again because it's been too long. Um, And you'll be doing yourself a great service if you do that. Not only that, but you know what? You're going to be talking to other people. Uh, If you're married, your spouse, or you'll be talking to your, one of your best friends, or you'll be teaching your kids, or you'll be, you know, whatever you're going to, you'll be a a greater influence on, on your, on your community. Yeah. Um, and it's all about getting the word out and letting people see who Jesus really is. Yeah. And not that, not that we don't know some of who Jesus is, but Mm -hmm. it's a fuller picture. And I've actually shared this resource recently with several people that I know and they're coming back to me like what (laughs) is this they're like how how did we not know this like why do we not know this and it's because and Ray Vanderland says that and I'm not saying we as in you and I but since Jesus time till now it's it's very obvious that Jews have been persecuted for the way they rejected Jesus Mm -hmm. and all these things and so Ray Vanderland says that we have consciously cut our Jewish roots because of the way they treated Jesus and reacted to him, Mm -hmm. which I think is a great disservice to all of us because if we're cutting off our Jewish roots, Jesus was Jewish. We need to know, we need to know our Jewish roots to understand Jesus more fully. So Yes, listen to this. You're going to be really excited. You're probably going to be telling people about it because I know (laughs) I have. I'm like learning stuff and I'm calling people and I'm like, did you know this, this, this? Like it's it just blows you away. So I think you're really going to like this. And I think we're going to follow up with another episode. Um, So stay tuned. And be sure to do your research. It will jack you up. I'm for sure. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Thanks. Thanks thanks for listening.